her state, which is a challenge. How many people have like challenging gardening situations? Right, you know, like it's too hot or it's too cold or too much rain or not enough rain. So she's gonna share some of her experiences, how she's been able to manage and cope with the, her climate conditions and maybe you'll get some nuggets out of that. You guys are probably all sick and tired of sitting still, so we're gonna take a deep breath and jump on the table or I don't know, hug your neighbor or something, say hi to somebody, and I'm going to start here in just a second. Okie doke. I don't know, how many people were not here yesterday? Most of you guys were here yesterday. So if you've never seen me before, um, got to hear a little bit more about my house yesterday, but I live off-grid in a tiny house in the mountains of the northwestern corner of Wyoming and that gives me an opportunity to um, garden in a pretty challenging spot. Now if you go south from here, you're gonna get people who have challenging gardens because they're way too hot. I don't have a whole lot of experience with that because my garden is really cold. So there's probably, um, one of the awesome things about YouTube and such is that you can find so many different people out there. So it's not like I know everything about gardens and if you've got a really, really hot climate, you should probably find somebody else gardening in the same kind of area as you and, and check out what they're learning or what they've done wrong and all of that stuff. Um, but I do live in a pretty uh, cool spot, both because it's really beautiful and because it's really cold for most of the year. Um, we get negative 30s in the winter. It snows generally from sometime in September, s snow that stays on the ground some from sometime in September to sometime in May, and it can snow at or freeze any day of the year. If you go to like oldfarmersalmanac.com, that gives you a spot to like put in your zip code and it'll tell you when your first frost, frost date is and your last frost date, how long your growing season is. And when you put in my spot, it says year-round frost risk, growing season not applicable. Uh, which is not super encouraging, but I do have a garden. You can see off to the side there of my tiny house. And I have been with some success growing things for quite a few years there. Um, this garden has been a work in progress, kind of like watching um, some of the stuff that Doug and Stacy have done or that Mike was talking about yesterday and stuff with their gardens and, and homesteads in general. Um, that's what the clearing looked like when I first rolled up, well, right before I rolled my tiny house in. So that's the same clearing as the, you know, picture before. Um, that's four years difference. So I started out with, I've got, well, first, I'm, I'm about 6,400 feet above sea level. So I'm in a, a northern area. I'm pretty high up in the air and uh, in, in the mountains. So one of my challenges are, you can probably see there's some tree shadows there, so I have some shade that's, that's good for some things and bad for others actually, but my soil was the first challenge. So when I went to turn up a garden, um, a friend had a big tractor, uh, tractor pulled um, rototiller that he brought over. I think we might have broke the rototiller actually because there was so much rock. So there you can see a pile of all the roots that clearing just had like wild berry bushes and stuff, service berries, June berries, if you know what those are. And so the, the first round pulled up roots and so I went through and, and picked up piles and piles of roots. And then we started turning up rocks. And I live just above a little creek and not too far from a fairly large river and the entire little bench where my house sits is on um, its river rock. If I go uh, down to the creek is like 23 vertical feet. So for at least 23 vertical feet straight down, it is all round river rocks. You can see more off on the side of the garden there. Um, like that's one tiny fraction of the pile of rocks we pulled out of there. Um, my friend thankfully was able to use his tractor bucket, so I did a lot of loading rocks in a bucket and he went and dumped them over the hill. So that's part of my rock pile. The dirt in between seemed really good, but there was like a rock here and a rock here, and there was about that much dirt in between. So my garden just started sinking as I pulled the rocks out. Um, 
but got them out, got a few inches of, of rocky, mostly rocky free. I've still got a lot of small pebbles, but mostly boulder free soil and started planting things. Now I planted things just in nice straight rows. I don't know why other than that's how we'd always done it when I was growing up. I, I grew up in a family of nine people and my parents had a large garden and so we planted things in long rows and then a space for like a little rototiller and then another long row and so on on down the garden. So I planted rows. Then I realized that I was going to have a problem with needing to be able to cover my garden because of frost with um, year-round frost risk that uh, was going to be important. So you can kind of see the little metal hoops um, that's to hold up my frost cover so they didn't crush the plants as they got bigger. And so I had my nice row, space, row, space, and then I had to figure out how to cover it. So this kind of changed what I was doing. Again, you can see I've got all my spaces in between, but then when I put my covers over, they were, they were kind of in the way. So I ended up going to, through the years here, more of um, a, a wider bed instead of individual rows, partly so that I could cover it easier and partly I just, I like the setup better in general. Um, that first year things grew for it pretty well for a brand new garden and talk about in a minute what I actually can grow because I can't grow everything. Um, you can see there I added a lot of, of actual hay. I had access to some hay that had been rained on from a neighboring ranch and they didn't want it anymore, so I thought that would make great mulch, and it did. So my plants were already growing that year, mulched it heavily, um, had a pretty decent yield. I was, I was pretty happy with it being a, a first year in that garden. There you can see my frost cloth kind of laying in between the, the rows when it was not in use on the, the garden. And that fall, I still had all of my carrots and stuff all grew in like shapes like this around my little pebbles because I didn't have any nice soil for them to grow nice and straight in. So we turned up the garden again and that, um, that fall I was able to find a truckload of old horse manure, a bunch of sawdust from uh, chainsaws from cutting my own firewood and mixed in all the the like vegetable and weed, you know, yard waste and, and kitchen waste compost that I had. And a little bit of leaves where I live, there's not many leaves. Almost all of our trees come with needles, not leaves. So there's not a lot of leaf mulch. Um, Till that in again. And I didn't really want to have to um, do that again. I wanted to be able to have a, a no-till garden for the health of the soil and the bacteria and the worms and all of that, but I wanted to get that worked in there. So you can see I kind of made that into nice long beds now with pathways in between, which was going to simplify my covering and still being able to walk around the garden process. So that's what it looked like before it snowed on it that fall. And, and I also mulched it because I had more, um, more old hay, so I covered it up. Then the snow melted finally in the spring, sometime around May. And uh, I don't have a lot of pictures from my garden this year because it was extremely discouraging. I planted stuff and a lot of things came up and then they'd just die. And then something else would come up and it would just die and some things didn't come up. It looks like there's some growing there for sure, but um, it, it looked actually worse than that photo in person. <laughs> And it took me a while to figure out what was going on. The hay mulch was absolutely awesome. I, I kind of got the idea from reading Ruth Stout's gardening books. If you haven't heard of her, I, I do recommend checking out um, some of the stuff she wrote, and she's an advocate of beet mulch. So I put that hay on there like this thick when I started, and of course, you know, given a few rains, it compacts down quite a bit. It was great for um, keeping moisture in. At this point, I hadn't really figured out a watering system for my garden. And so it did a really good job of that. It uh, definitely added a lot of hummus as the bottom layers of that started rotting into the ground. My earthworms went crazy when we first turned the garden over with that tractor. I think the first year when I planted things, I found maybe like two earthworms in the entire thing. And after a year with hay mulch, I mean, every, every handful of dirt I got had a dozen worms in it. Um, but I couldn't figure out what was going on. And then, I was helping, I, I do some work on the property where I live in exchange for being able to park my house there. And I was helping in one of their hay fields and I saw some little weeds coming up, a weed in that case being anything that's not a grass because it's grass hay. 
and they were coming up looking sickly. And they said, oh, that's because we, you know, we sprayed that with an herbicide last year. It's supposed to stay in the ground as a residue for a couple of years and prevent them from coming up. But it wasn't quite preventing them because they were coming up. But I looked at them and thought they look exactly like the veggies coming up and dying in my garden. Um, and that's when I realized I had accidentally poisoned my garden with the hay mulch. Um, I'm still a pretty big fan of a lot of the benefits of mulching with hay. But be very, very careful, after losing most of my garden that year, I learned to be very, very careful with where you are sourcing your mulch, whether it's hay or something else. Um, the, the one chemical that was used in that um, herbicide, after some further research, lingers for usually about three years, and, and it's just, it's hard to get rid of. Um, even though the hay was nice and it looked well rotted and stuff, nothing, I didn't have weeds because nothing would grow, um, but the only things that would grow were grassy things. So I think my onions did okay because they weren't a broad leafed thing and a, a couple things did grow, but anything with a wide leaf just died. Um, and even talking to the one local, and somebody said report it to your county because they should know about that. It was actually purchased from the county um, weed control program, that's what they use. So if you're getting hay from somebody, or this could be true with grass clippings or other things, if you want to use them as compost food or mulch material in your garden, be very, very, very careful that you know what was on there and what it's going to um, potentially kill in your garden. So that was a discouraging year. So I took all the hay out. I watered the garden a ton to hopefully try to flush the, um, the remaining you know, residue out and and let it snow sit on it all winter long and um, was optimistic that this year it would be a little better. So again, I have my beds, um, which has worked out to be a good setup. There you can see another shot of the spring, things just starting to grow. And this year I've had a, a pretty decent um, garden with one pest exception, which I will talk about. So kind of uh, things evolve over time as, as you garden, you'll probably figure out what works for you and in your situation and your dirt and what you want to grow. Uh, but for me, it's worked really well to use a kind of a wide bed. I would like it to eventually be a raised bed that was up higher, kind of like Doug and Stacy have got some awesome, you know, like waist high ones so you don't have to bend over. Um, but right now mine are just raised by, you know, kind of raking the dirt up so they are a little bit raised. And then instead of planting things in rows, um, you know, down the bed, I've done more blocks. So you can kind of see there I've got a, a block of cabbage and then a block of onions and, and so on. Um, it's just a little easier to keep track of the different things. And I again repeat, you know, there's cabbages down there and cabbages here. And I know there's carrots there and carrots over there. Um, which can help with keeping pests away from finding everything all at once. So I think I was able to get the, the herbicide residue out of the garden because this year things grew, they, they sprouted and came up and did not die, which was very exciting. Um, the other thing that's worked well for me from the start is that what you're looking at there is a old locker from a local gym. They were throwing them away when they remodeled. And I took a bunch of them and pulled the door hinges off and laid them on their back and made a skirting the entire way around my tiny house. And then I made them into planters. So they're pretty deep and I filled them up. I didn't want to move that much dirt and I had lots of rocks. So I filled up the bottom with rocks um, just so water could drain through there because I didn't figure I was planting anything that was gonna need that much root depth in there. And um, filled it up with dirt the rest of the way and I've been planting herbs and some flowers just because I like flowers, even if they're not useful. Um, not even all of them are great pollinator flowers. I know some flowers are very useful, <laughs> um, but all around the sides of the house. And they have been beautiful, and I have never had any real pest um, problems with anything eating things in there. It's probably partly because they are right up against the side of my house, but I think also partly being out of the ground. When I talk about some of my predators, uh, in a minute here, that is also helpful. So I, I would like to eventually go to having more um, 
more raised beds for the whole garden, but that has worked really, really well for having my herbs right outside the house. If I'm cooking, I just run out the door and grab some parsley or some oregano or whatever I need and, and go back to cooking, which has been great. I do have a lot of pests. Um, if I, these things are beautiful and wildlife photography is kind of a hobby of mine. So they're not pests when I'm taking photos, but when they get in my garden, then they are. So we've got lots of deer, um, bigger deer, that's a female moose, there's a male, uh, lots of elk, probably have at least a few hundred elk walk through the property where I live every year. Um, smaller guys, like these little fellows, which are actually more annoying. Um, and I have a fence, I don't think I put in here a good clear picture, I have a fence the entire way around my clearing to keep out the big guys, it does not stop him. Um, but it's because I'm not in a permanent location because I'm not on my own land and it, I have videos on my YouTube channel about all this stuff. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I'm going to run out of time today if I explain it all. Um, so I've used like the, I think it's seven foot high, like black kind of a plastic mesh deer netting. And I just um, took a post pounder and drove in uh, steel T posts around and then wrapped that around. I do have to check on it every now and then because it's only held up with uh, zip ties, but and so sometimes they break. But it's worked pretty well. It was pretty inexpensive, and I know it's something I can take down whenever I move. And it wasn't a huge investment in a permanent fence, but that works to stop deer, moose, elk, all that kind of thing. Because um, the first thing you're going to kind of have to figure out, though, a big part of me wants to say everybody should just plant more stuff. So if you've never gardened, just uh, go over to Baker Creek and get a package of seeds and go plant them. Most of you here are from somewhere not too far from Missouri, and from compared to my place, I feel like everything grows here. If you can't grow anything here, I don't know what's going on because it's hot and there's water and there's humidity, and plants just love that stuff as much as I hate it. <laughs> plants really like that. But in addition to just saying everyone should plant more things, plant flowers, plant herbs, plant veggies, um, you'll learn as you go. It is helpful if you're going to try to do a big garden to plan ahead for, for some of these issues that are going to arise. So figure out, you probably have very different wildlife in your location than I do. So I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. I know raccoons can be a big problem in a garden um, and, and the wildlife can, can vary a lot. My biggest problem has been the little guys. My chipmunks haven't eaten a whole, they, they chew off a plant every now and then, but they haven't been a big deal. And I do have some natural help um, with controlling rodents. We've got a lot of kinds of owls. If you've never seen a great gray owl like the one on that side, they stand about this tall. They can eat a lot of rodents in a day. Um, also got these guys around. They all eat lots of rodents. I could use a few more. Um, more big birds, we've got eagles and hawks and, and they eat a lot of things. So I do have some help to keep the rodent population in check, but I still live in the woods where there is lots of shelter, lots of trees around, lots of berry bushes along the edge. So it gives the little, little things lots of places to hide. Um, this year, goes back to the, the rodent problem, my biggest problem has been um, uh, I don't have a photo because they don't really come above ground. I've got a pocket gopher or 40 or so in my garden and they, um, their behavior is they tunnel underground. They are a herbivore, so they're actively eating plants and their roots. And what they do, they don't come above ground. They're, they're pretty smart like that. They're also smart about staying out of traps and not eating poisons and lots of other things. But they'll grab your, you know, happy little plant hair that's, that's above the ground level and they grab by the roots and they simply, I've watched my plants do that. An entire, you know, uh, Brussels sprout plant that was this tall just disappear under the soil, which is really frustrating. Um, that would be another reason I think I want to do raised beds in the future because I've never had anything like that try to get in them. I don't, they couldn't tunnel into them. So as long as I put something underneath and, and build a bed that holds the dirt up, I think that will take care of my rodent problem. And so then I think, and gardening is always a learning process, but I think I'll have resolved my um, issue with poisoning my dirt and my issue with um, my, my biggest predator that is eating my plants. And then I think I will have an even more productive garden. The other one that's huge in my area is water. I, while we get, 
four to 700 inches of snow in a winter, we get very, very little rain in the summer. And a lot of that snow being on rocky soil, it, that moisture drains away pretty quickly. And so it is, it's not a very moist climate. Um, some places you live, you may figure out, have to figure out how to not have too much water um, and, and how to provide adequate drainage to your garden. My garden drains very well. I have a problem with having enough water. When I started, I don't have pictures of me doing this because I didn't have time to set up a camera. My garden and house are up here, and if you drop about 23 feet straight down, there's a little creek. So there's water handy. So I had two five-gallon buckets, and I marched down to the creek, filled them both up, came up, poured them into watering cans, went down and got more, went down and got more, went down and got more, then it got hotter and sunnier, and I went down and got more, and at this point it was taking me like four or five hours a day just to have the garden not dry up and die completely. Um, and I enjoy watering plants, but that was getting overwhelming. Um, <laughs> so then I actually built a water ram. If you have not heard of it, go look it up on YouTube. Um, it's, it's like Victorian era technology that uses the, the, the fall, gravity and fall of water in a creek or, or a few other places you can put it to pump water uphill. It doesn't take any gasoline, any, it doesn't have any kind of engine. It just has some swinging check valves and it will pump uh, not a huge volume, but a, a small trickle of water uphill continuously, potentially forever until the, the metal wears out on the valves. Um, that was a huge improvement. So this pumped like a little trickle, it was a really little dribble, but if you measured it, it, it ran 24-7. That got me about 700 gallons of water pumped up onto the hill right beside my garden a day. So this was a huge improvement. Now I didn't have to walk up and down the hill carrying my water. This goes back to uh, the wisdom of making some plans before you start doing things, which can make your life a lot easier than just starting things and not being prepared and then you have to carry buckets and buckets of water uphill. So we filled a tank, but I still, I couldn't get water pressure from it at all because I didn't have enough fall in the creek to pump it high enough, nor did I have a water tower or something to get gravity pressure coming back down from it. But at least I didn't have to go down the hill and carry it so I could just go fill my watering can out of one of my tanks and, and water. And, but that still could take a good bit of time when it was very dry. Those are sprinklers running in the garden. They obviously require some water pressure to run. So while I had a great setup that was working with a water ram that required no electricity um, or power or gas or anything, I was unable to get water pressure from it. And if you're familiar with water rams, I didn't have um, the ability to get more volume or pressure because the creek was so shallow and it was up against a property line already, so I, I couldn't extend my volume on that. So I borrowed um, what's known as a trash pump from a friend. If you guys follow Doug and Stacy, you most recently saw Doug use the exact same one to empty 3,000 gallons of water out of the bottom of their um, root cellar project. Anyway, that trash pump sits down in the creek and it pumps enough volume up the hill with enough pressure for me to run four sprinklers at once. So I've got four hoses that come off of it and I just spread them out, you know, set the timer for 15 minutes move the sprinklers all over, set it for another 15 minutes, during which time I can be doing other things, not carrying water. And I'm now able to keep my garden good and wet. Um, so this goes back to the, the things you're gonna have to figure out how to manage. You're gonna have to figure out how you're going to, what you're gonna put your um, plants or seeds into, where you're gonna get your dirt, you're gonna be in the ground, are you gonna be on a raised bed? Um, how are you going to control things that are going to start eating them promptly, whether it's your free-range chickens digging up your buckwheat, or um, voles munching through your, or gophers munching through your stuff. You're gonna figure out how to make it wet enough, um, because things grow in, obviously, in the wild and in nature all on their own, but when we're planting gardens, we're usually wanting, um, often, both a higher yield from a smaller space and a more reliable yield. Some things, there's wild berry bushes around my, place in some years there's no berries. Um, they, they froze at the wrong time or they dried up too early or something. And when I plant a garden, I would like to plan on eating things from it every year, not half the years. Though that can still happen, but um, the next big one for me is frost. So there you can actually see my frost covers 
the hoops that I used, uh, a lot of people use PVC, but where it gets so cold for me, I was afraid it would crack. And I've got a whole video about how I made these, but it's, uh, it's something called ladder mesh. It's a metal wire used in reinforcing concrete. And I was able to just stick the ends in the ground, and then I've got you know long sheets of the frost cover material. It's a little bit breathable. It's not like a plastic, so if the sun comes up, the plants aren't all going to cook to death under there. But it keeps it like six degrees warmer than the outside temperature with that weight of frost cloth. And for me, that is really important because it is in the summer, like I said, it can frost or snow anytime, but even a normal summer night is like 38 degrees or something. And so I check the forecast all the time, all summer long. And any time I see a forecast, because the forecast is usually done you know, for the closest town. I live out of town and I live a little higher and I live up more in the mountains than the town. So if the forecast says 30 anything, I'm gonna cover my garden because there's a good chance it's gonna freeze at my house. So that system works pretty well. Um, you can see all my, my tunnels there. Um, and if you live in a much hotter area, you might have to figure out shade instead. I know, I, th I, think, uh, I think Derek and his wife have some shade cloths over there, in Arizona garden, and I assume that's because they actually get too much heat. Um, I don't get too much heat, but I do occasionally get too much sun as crazy as that sounds it's not hot but living at such a high elevation i when i grew up gardening in pennsylvania things like lettuce you just planted in full sun and they grew happily there until it got too hot in the summer and then they bolted if you hadn't eaten them um, for me when i planted lettuce in full sun after a, a sunny afternoon being that high with that much i don't know if it's the uv or what part of the sunlight exposure it looked like somebody microwaved my lettuce Every single leaf was like limp and cooked. So I've learned when you live in high in the mountains in Wyoming, you don't grow lettuce in sun at all. I actually now plant my lettuce in full shade behind my house and it grows beautifully. So that's another thing. If you're, if you're living somewhere and have garden sub and then you're moving to a new homestead or something, you're probably gonna have to play around with what are the differences in the, if it's not next door to where you used to live. With figuring out what are those differences, I would have never dreamed that I couldn't put, you know, lettuce right in the in the sun to grow. But I learned that that was the case. Um, I have short summers. I have experimented with growing things I would very much like to grow that will not grow for me. That's a tomato plant. It's flowering. That is all the bigger my tomatoes got before they froze. So after trying that for two years, and this was. That's like a 50-day tomato, the uh, you know quickest growing subarctic zero variety out there. I decided even if I get one or two tiny tomatoes, this is not worth the time and the effort and the frustration to try to grow tomatoes when I live in a spot where tomatoes just aren't going to grow realistically. So I just don't plant tomatoes anymore, which is very sad. And then I come here somewhere like this and uh, eat lots of tomatoes when I'm somewhere that tastes good because grocery store tomatoes are not the same thing. Um, I also love basil, it's probably my favorite cooking herb, and sadly, lots of herbs can take lots and lots of frost, but um, basil freezes if the weather forecast thinks about getting cold. So that was a beautiful little patch of basil that had all come up about this high, and then, as you can see, it's all completely frost blackened other than a few of the bottom leaves, and I don't think they ever recovered. So I don't grow basil either, it's just... I had to figure out, and again, there might be some things if you live somewhere very hot that just aren't gonna, you know, they need cooler weather. At some point, you just gotta put your time and effort and energy into growing something that you have a reasonable chance of getting a production from in your area. And if you want those other things, you're gonna have to figure out a different way to source them because they're simply not gonna grow there. Now, probably your next question is gonna be, why don't you have a greenhouse? Obviously, that would fix your problems. It would, and someday I hope to have a greenhouse, it would fix some problems. In my current spot, again, I'm not there permanently. My house is on wheels. I can fold up my swing and my solar panels, stick them in my house, and I can go down the road whenever I need to. If I had a greenhouse, that would complicate being able to pack up and move things. Also, since we get such big temperature swings from usually in the 70s during the day, occasionally 80s. I think yesterday we set a record. It was actually 90 at home, which is crazy. Um, I would definitely have to have it ventilated during the day, and then I would probably have to have it heated a lot of nights if I really wanted to extend my growing season. 
So I would either have to put in a wood stove and check on and maintain the temperature overnight, or I would have to put in a bigger solar setup to be able to run kind of some kind of electric heating and thermostat. And so as much fun as a greenhouse would be, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense in my area for right now. So I just grow the things that I can. I also tried starting my own seeds indoors. Um, if you missed it, I've got a 24 foot long tiny house. So I've got about 200 square feet. I didn't have enough direct light um, coming in big enough windows for that. You can see my little seed starts there, started getting all leggy and tipping sideways. I didn't have any good way to put a grow light over them. I, um, I like my windows not being in direct sun in the summer and because of trees and stuff, but it just didn't, again, this was one of the things I tried and put energy and time into and then realized I just don't have enough space to start my own things. It's a better use of my time to just go down to the local greenhouse who probably buys them from, I don't know, Missouri, and they come in on a truck and just get little cabbage starts and, and some of those things I would like to, to start ahead of time that ended up being a better use of my energy than trying to grow them all and just having them be these little spindly, leggy, sideways things that didn't really grow happily once I put them outside anyway. I do grow everything I can from seed. Regardless of the fact that Baker Creek's back there, I've actually been buying all my seeds from Baker Creek for quite a few years. Um, didn't even realize they were here in Missouri, actually. When you mail order things, you don't always think about exactly where the company is located. Um, but they have all heirloom seeds, and there is a few things that actually mature enough for me that I can save my own seeds and replant. Um, so I value that, while, though a lot of my things barely get to actually making a fruit and don't make a, a mature seed, so I can't always save my own seeds. Um, despite all those challenges, and this is partly why I encourage you, even if you think you've got a black thumb and have no idea what you're doing, whatever, get some seeds or plants and start growing things, because despite all of that, I have actually produced food in the last several years. I got two whole strawberries before my chipmunks ate the rest. Um, I do love growing lots of fun things, and this is another reason why you go check out Baker Creek's catalogs. Those are, you probably can't tell because they're sliced, those are all carrots. I think I grew like seven kinds of carrots. And if you only had orange carrots, that's awesome, but you should have purple carrots with orange centers, and you should have bright yellow carrots, and you should have lavender carrots, and you should have purpley black carrots, and you should have red carrots. And not only is that a lot more fun and pretty and interesting to see all the colors, um, there's actually, I know Stacy talks about this kind of thing a lot. There's different nutrients in all the different colors, um, slightly different, you know, a carrot's still very different than an apple, but um, each, each different color has slightly different, um, you know, profiles of nutrients. And so the more different stuff you're eating, the better rounded your diet's going to be and much more fun. You can also grow things like candy king striped beets. I love red beets anyway, but those are even more fun. Um, so this is kind of giving you an idea of some of the stuff I can grow. Those are garlic scapes. That's the flower trying to grow on the top of a garlic plant. Mostly what I can grow is leaf things or root things, not big fruit things. So I can't do corn, watermelon, tomatoes, all those stuff that needs like 100 day growing seasons. Um, but I can still grow a lot of food. So that was kind of my fall harvest right before a good hard freeze the one year. I can grow potatoes. They just only get about this big. You know, if they had more time, they would end up being bigger. But I can grow little potatoes. Um, I can grow carrots and beets and onions and garlic and uh, radishes. And then lots of leafy things as well. That's more carrots um, and more onions and potatoes and beets. Oh, and you can eat flowers too. If you, uh, I know Flower talked about a bunch of herbs and stuff, but do by all means check on things and be sure you know what you're doing if it's something you have never eaten before. But pansies, for instance, are edible. The flower is edible and it makes a beautiful salad. People also ask me, oh, because when they look at the size of my small house, they say, what do you do with all of your food because you have such a huge garden? Well, the answer is mostly we eat it. Me and all of my friends that I have over for dinners um, have a lot of big salads, often topped with elk steak in the summer, and lots of stir fries and curries. And when I can produce enough of anything to have extra above and beyond what we just eat, I do, um, I do can, pickle, freeze, ferment, 
And you, yes, you can do all that in a tiny house. I just have less space for some other things, but this is what I like doing. Um, and you can even sometimes grow big things like cabbages. I think my record cabbage got a head like that. I know some places they grow like this, but my record was like this, which is exciting because I get lots of cabbage heads like that. Um, and that's just another good shot where you can see the house. Um, so I think before you, I want to say first go get a plant or some seeds or something if you've never gardened and plant something somewhere because it really is an addicting habit and gardening is probably a gateway drug into like the homesteading life. You, you, get, you get concerned about your health and so you want to grow some food and so you plant some lettuce and next thing you know you have a 10,000 square foot garden and you're turning it up with a mule team and then all of a sudden you have chickens and they're definitely the gateway animals so then next you have hogs and cows and sheep and goats and whatever. But so, so plant something and make sure you plant something you know you'll eat. If you hate carrots, don't plant carrots. I mean, learn to like carrots, but do that next. Um, <laughs> plant uh, onions or something you know you're going to use in your cooking. Um, and then while that stuff is growing and you're getting excited about how fun it is to watch little green leaves come up and so on, then figure out what are you going to do for your spot and your location to figure out um, kind of the big ones, the, how are you going to control the climate, how are you going to make sure it's not, not too hot, not too cold, not too sunny, um, not too shady, and you know, obviously you're not going to put an air conditioner out there and make your whole yard cool or something, but you can figure out where, where you want to put your garden, you know, don't plant it under a giant oak tree or something, you're never going to get enough light to grow hardly anything. Um, so figuring out how you're going to manage the, the, the climatic challenges, and then how are you going to figure out the watering challenges? Um, do you need to make a raised bed because you have way too much water and your stuff's going to sit in water and rot and die? Um, do you have, have you put your garden up on top of a rocky hillside where you have to walk up and down with buckets of water um, all summer long? Uh, if you have done that, how are you going to get the water up the hill in a more efficient manner? Um, so trying to figure out some of those things. How are you going to keep wildlife out? Um, so people have more problem with birds, you might have to do a bird netting over the top, even if you don't have to fence moose out of the sides. Um, and yeah, that's kind of the, and, and be very cautious um, with what you put on your garden as a mulch, because there's lots of free things you can get in different areas that are great, but they may be poisoned and you might find it out too late. So you gotta figure out all of that stuff, but then just, I have fun. I mean, one of my friends is like, why do you spend so much time gardening? Half of your stuff dies, and half of it won't grow in the first place. It's like, because it's, there's something about, and probably a lot of you guys have done, there's something about being out there and seeing little things grow when you plant this little dried up seed, and all of a sudden these pretty little green leaves spring out of the ground. You can see it change every day, and you know you're growing food, and you, you know what's in it, and, um, it's just exciting. So if you have never gardened, I, I strongly encourage you to start. And even if you don't have space for a big garden out in the dirt like this, I mean, I, I grow a ton of stuff in those old lockers around my house. If you have a little back patio or a you know alley beside your house or something, you can plant a lot of stuff in in small containers. If you've got one sunny window, I mean, put a pot in it and grow something. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to try growing things and you will learn things all the time. I read a book by a gardener who said, just be careful what you say you've never had a problem with because she wrote a book and after 25 years of gardening, she said, the one thing I've never had a problem with is, I don't know what it was, something like squash beetles. And she said promptly after the book was published, squash beetles ate my entire garden the next year. So that's kind of how gardening goes. You're, you're trying to figure out how to most sensibly control and manage and um, moderate the things you can, but I mean, there's a verse that says, you know, you plant the seeds and God gives the increase. You, you can't control everything and you are working with nature and wind and sun and rain and weather and wind storms and bugs and all kinds of things. You cannot control everything. But like a lot of other things, if you can figure out the things you can control and moderate, then it gives you less total issues to come up. This is my garden a few days. It's probably, I don't, those photos just don't show up very well there. Um, 
few days before I came here. Things are growing pretty well this year. I have gotten a good bit. I've been, you know, making salads and stuff all all summer long, and um, and it's unusually hot, so I didn't even cover it when I left. Normally, if I go out of town for even a day in the summer, I leave it all covered up in case it freezes before I get back. So just um, get out there and 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 try something, and again, find. You know, I'm sure the folks at Baker Creek would be a great resource for what grows best in your area. That's another thing if you, I'm not sure if this is really quite on topic, but if you're looking for a homestead and it's not next, you know, if you know you're not buying a place next door to where you already live or something, if you're looking at different climates, um, there's a lot of areas where big chunks of of land are fairly similar. If you decide you're moving somewhere in the Mountain West, Go look at the ground that you're thinking about in the early spring, in the late spring, in the early fall, in the late fall, because as you walk across like a valley, you know, there'll be mountains on this side and mountains on this side, you will quickly learn that, oh, this place gets spring here a full month before this one. You know, this one had green grass growing and just a couple miles away there because of a slight difference of angle or elevation, they still had six feet of snow on the ground. If you want to grow things, that makes a big difference. And growing zone um, tells you some useful information. It basically tells you how cold something gets. And if you'll see seeds and plants and like Stark Brothers out there, they're fruit trees. They'll say grows up to a certain, you know, growing zone five or something like that. That's how cold the coldest day normally gets. So I'm growing zone three, which means that I forget where it exactly cuts off. Our, our coldest days are somewhere around negative 30 to negative 40 um, Fahrenheit. But that doesn't tell you whether you get one day like that or whether you get 364 of them. Um, and that makes a big difference as well. So you need to know more than just a growing zone when you're going to um, plant things. And especially in mountainous areas, because I've had to learn this, just be very mindful if you go somewhere and you're like, oh, what a pretty garden they have, and then you buy somewhere 20 minutes from there. You could have two or three months more of winter if that other place 20 minutes away is just a little higher, just a little more shaded, a little more north facing. Um, I assume if you live somewhere very hot, you probably want more north facing stuff for, um, for some shade and protection from the sun. When you're up further north, you want all south facing stuff because otherwise it can be wintry and cold all of the time. And what Doug said that he did not do go out there and hang out, you know, if you've picked your piece of property, go out there and hang out and you will learn stuff. Um, again, I've got videos about this, but I am in the process of, in a few years, moving to my own land because I'm not on my own land at the moment. And I have already camped on it quite a few times and I've already learned things that I didn't know when I bought it. Uh, there was one spot I thought would be great to put the house. I learned very, very quickly it's the noisiest spot around because you can hear logging trucks from way up in the mountain because it's on a hilltop and so you can hear all the sound. And it's a really long way from where I would want the garden and stuff and it's a steep hill in between and I would have to walk up and down all the time and you only had to do that about one day in the summer in the sunshine to decide that is not where I want my house after all. I have my tent there and just having to go back and forth to the tent, I was like, no way. I'm sure that I didn't have my house built here before I, or even parked there because even moving a house as heavy as mine is a you know, bit of a hassle. I'm glad I hadn't settled in before I realized things like that. So, and, and a lot of things for the same for gardening, go and check it out, look at it as the snow melts. Where does, where does it melt first? Where does it pile up first? Where is, where is the shade at the time or the sun when you would be growing things because especially the further north again, you get the, you know, the, the lower the sun gets in the, in the sky in the winter. So if you think you know where the sun and shade is at one time of year, it's not in the same place other times of the year. So do some research on your location if you can help it. Then the last thing is if you've got, if none of that applies to you and you have no room outside and you think I haven't even got a patio, I don't have a back deck, I can't grow anything at all, um, you can sprout. I grow sprouts all winter long. All that involves is at least a little bit of indirect light. And even with it snowing all day every day and the sun not coming up till eight and setting again at four in the afternoon, uh, I get plenty of light to turn sprouts green in my windows. And I grow alfalfa and broccoli and you can do a lot of different beans and stuff. But I grow sprouts all winter long. So if you've got even a tiny bit of light, 
Um, I guess you could probably even grow them with no light. They just wouldn't get, uh, probably wouldn't be quite as nutritious with, without being able to turn green. But you can grow little tiny baby plants with no dirt or ground or patio or anything at all. So if you've never tried that, that's also a blast. And if you've got children, it's fun because while I love seeing things grow in the garden and it's um, you know fun that you plant a seed and five days later you see little leaves coming up and then a second set of leaves and so on, sprouting is even more fun because you can see, um, you, you soak the seeds in water and in like 12 hours you see something happening. You see this first little you know, sprout sticking out of the seed and by the next morning it's twice as long and by the morning after that it's already made two little leaves and even if you didn't like eating sprouts it's just a blast to try. It's like a science project um, because you can see instant results. You're not going out there and looking at your garden and wondering, hmm, I wonder if that's ever going to come up because you can see it instantly. So whether you can have dirt or not, I would encourage you to uh, do that. And if, if you do have a big garden, I'd still encourage you to do that all winter long if you live somewhere that you can't grow things outside because um, that's a whole other topic. But sprouts are extremely nutritious, even more so than mature plants a lot of the time. And you can do it inside in the winter when otherwise I would either not have fresh things or have to spend a lot of money for half mediocre fresh things from the grocery store. So... I'm going to check how I'm doing on time. Um, Doug, am I out of time? Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. Five minutes. Uh, does, oh, okay. Five minutes. <laughs> does anybody have any questions about that? Anything I forgot to say or was unclear about or that you're wondering about? Or I don't know if Doug's hand need to run a mic around. If not, you just have to yell at me. What about a collapsible greenhouse I could take with me? That would work, except for I would still have the issues with I would need to install some kind of um, heating and controlling management system to really get a lot of benefit out of it. Because if I just had an unheated plastic box, I'd have to be there the minute the sun started coming up to manually open it at, uh, and let air in so I didn't cook everything to death. You, if you want to kill a big spot of your lawn sometime, try laying a plastic sheet on it in the sun and just leave it there for about four hours. Um, so I would have to be there, like super attentive to that and then to really ex be able to extend my season much um, from what I already have, I'd have to be able to keep it warm at night and not have it be uh, frozen at night. So I would have to either have a whole second wood stove or have some other way to electronically manage that. And I just don't have a setup for that. But a greenhouse is in my dreams someday. Yep. You? Oh, you're there. Yeah, Aaron, this morning, with all the rocks you had beforehand, the bottom of it, and this, I'm not a gardener, so I don't know. But if you excavated that and put the rocks down underneath and the dirt on top, would that prevent those little critters from going there if you built them? If I could make a solid rock layer, I probably could. My rocks are all river rocks, so they were all tumbled and they're very round. And you know, when you put two round things together, you've got these big gaps in between. Um, plus the dirt would tend to wash down through those. I think because of that, I need something a little more solid and flat, like a, a wire mesh with concrete around it or flat pavers or, or something like that. Um, and the other thing is I did use up most of the river rock, the little lane that goes up to my house. Um, was about four feet narrower than the wheelbase of my house. So to get my house up that hill, most of the rock that came out of the garden went into making that lane wide enough to be able to tow my house up it. So it's now part of my lane. What the, what do you use for pests? Keep the uh, spray on or whatever. Um, like for bugs? Yes. I, that's one advantage of living somewhere where your growing season isn't long. I don't know if you guys have noticed, probably first thing in the spring you don't have a lot of pests and as the summer goes on you get more and more. So if your season's really short, for one, there's pests I simply don't get because they haven't had time to get there or find things before they freeze to death again. Um, so that helps. But I, I haven't had a big problem. I think a big part of it is having a healthier plant, kind of like your body. If you have a healthy immune system, you get a cold germ and you don't get sick. You know, you're around people who have the flu and you don't get sick. For plants, it's a lot the same. You're always going to have, and I see on my cabbages, 
little bites here and there, um, or little nips out of leaves, but if your plants are well nourished and healthy, they're gonna get way less bugs, so that would be the second thing. And then um, for what I think it was like the fat juicy bugs, like um, caterpillar things and cabbage worms and such, I do use um, DE, diatomaceous earth, which you can get in a food grade, it's edible, it's not gonna hurt you, but it's got very microscopically sharp little edges, and if you're a caterpillar, it basically scratches you to death. And you can just dust that on there and it's nothing toxic to you. You can take it in, I mean, people take the as a supplement anyway um, for the, the minerals in it. And then very early this spring, um, as you probably know, if you grow rhubarb, the, the leaves are poisonous. You can eat the stem, that's what you make rhubarb, strawberry pie out of. Um, but the leaves are, are somewhat toxic. I actually made a tea out of just brewing the leaves in some water and then letting, you know, getting it hot, and letting it sit overnight, stringing the leaves out. It is something that is still toxic to you, unlike the DE, so you don't want to put that on any leaf that you are going to eat, but I had some kind of little flea beetle right when the first little pair of leaves was coming up on things like that big. They were eating holes through them and nearly killing them, and I knew I wasn't going to eat that first seed leaf on any of those things myself. It was going to have to be a much bigger plant. And the minute the leaves got bigger, the flea beetles, I guess, weren't big enough or strong enough to chew through it. But on my first tiny little seedling pairs of leaves coming up, I did use a spray bottle and spritz my poisonous rhubarb leaf tea on there, and that seemed to knock back my flea beetle problem. That's about the only two things I've used in my garden for bug control. Anybody else? Go on. I guess not. I know everything. Go on twice. Go home and, and garden. Thanks for watching, folks. If you're interested in more info on my off-grid tiny house life, check out some of my other videos here. And if you like what you're seeing, click the little picture of my house to subscribe and then hit the little bell so YouTube actually notifies you every time there's a new video available. See you all next time.